Good evening. I'm Allison Holmes. I'm the Associate Dean for Student Affairs, and I am chair of the Cybertson Faculty Committee. And I'm really honored to be hosting this evening's program. Before we get started, I would like to run through a number of housekeeping items. So our goal this evening is to make this virtual environment really feel as close as we can to all of you being here in Hanover with our students. So please feel free to turn your camera on as if you're comfortable to make this conversational. So I, I came into this part of the house, the home office, you know, sometimes we might do events at the Dartmouth Outing Club. So we've got a little bit of, you know, rural New Hampshire and old snowshoes in the background for, for that feel for you. Um, so um, today's program is being recorded. It'll be made available to you through a follow-up survey that is sent to you tomorrow. So please take a brief moment to provide your feedback and help us to be able to enhance any future programming. During the presentation, if you have a question or any technical issues, please feel free to submit that through the chat function, which is located at the very bottom of your Zoom window. We'll do our best to get all of your questions answered this evening. So I'd like to share with you an update on the Cybertson program and really the impact of scholarship at Geisel for our students. You'll hear from two of our alumni donors and the Cybertson committee members, and then you'll have a chance to connect with one of our Cybertson um, scholars, our current senior year students in breakout rooms. So who, who was Dr. Cybertson? We celebrate our Cybertson Scholars and Fellow, and we're really celebrating scholarships overall at Geisel. So Dr. Cybertson was the former dean of the Dartmouth Medical School, and every student who came through Dartmouth between 1923 and 1960 remembers him as a professor of anatomy an administrator, a dean, and especially a mentor. Through his example, he fostered academic accomplishments and scientific rigor, a passion for learning, a love of medicine, while also cultivating in students a breadth and depth of human concern and a sense of community spirit and citizenship. So I'd really like to share now a little history about the Cybertson Fund. This has been granted annually since 1985. The Cybertson Awards honor outstanding fourth year students who are considered the first among their peers in exemplifying the qualities Dr. Cybertson stood for that have become deeply embedded in the culture of our medical school. Six scholars are nominated by a faculty committee and then a fellow is selected from among the group by the Cybertson Memorial Committee, which is composed of alumni. Awards to the Cybertson Scholars and Fellows are funded by contributions to the Ralph C. Cybertson Memorial Endowment Fund. As I hope you saw in the opening slides, 90% of the interest from the Cybertson Fund goes to need-based scholarships that are apart from this award. This was over $156,000 that went to 14 students in the financial year of 2021. The other 10% of the endowment went to fund our five scholars and one fellow who you'll be meeting this evening. So while we are celebrating the Cybertson Fund and scholars this evening, I'd be remiss if I didn't share that all of our scholarships are need-based. 236 of our medical students are receiving scholarships this year. So 58% of our students receive some scholarship support and more than 44% of our students unfortunately leave with $200,000 or more in student loan debt, which is why we really increasingly need scholarship support. It's a very top priority. Um, and efforts to lower the debt our students leave with would not be possible without alumni and friends who give annually to support them in these scholarship efforts. I wanna add that when I was looking at this um, administrative position back almost two years ago when I was preparing to apply for it, 
financial aid and scholarship and debt reduction were one of the two main platform items that I went to the search committee with. I think it's incredibly important that we increase scholarship for our students and reduce their debt burden. So this is the Cybertson Faculty Committee. It's a small group, but we're fairly diverse in terms of the contexts within which we know our students. We use a process where we review um, the group of the students who are in academically in the top quarter of the class. And then we use other submitted materials to the committee uh, to look at the qualities that we are looking for for the Cybertson Award, including their contributions to their Geisel community, to the greater community, and their contributions in terms of academic scholarship and potential contribution to the academic medicine community. The alumni committee gathers annually to interview the scholars the faculty committee has set forth and then makes a selection for the fellow. I'd really like to thank the alumni for their continued service on the committee and their unwavering support of the Cybertson Fund and of other scholarships and Cybertson scholarships here at Geisel. I am really thrilled that we have a pair of alumni who both not only serve on the Cybertson Alumni Committee, but also support the fund annually. It's my great honor to introduce Drs. Martha Wu, an internist, and Dr. Seth McLennan, a cardiatric electrophysiologist, who are both graduates of the Dartmouth Medical School class of 1997. Welcome, Drs. Wu and McLennan. Thank you, Dr. Holmes. And a hearty congratulations to this year's Cybertson and Scholars and Fellows. I'm Martha Wu, and this is Seth McLennan. And as Dr. Holmes mentioned, we graduated from the medical school in 1997, and we were both Cybertson Scholars and Fellows from that graduating class. I am an internal medicine physician in Boston, affiliated with Beth Israel and Brigham and Women's Hospital. And Seth is a cardiac electrophysiologist affiliated with Sastro Hospital and Brigham and Women's Hospital. We are so honored to be here speaking today on behalf of the Cybertson program. As you've already heard, Ralph Cybertson was a beloved mentor at Dartmouth Medical School for almost 40 years. He left such an incredible impact on those around him that he inspired students, some of whom are attending today, to generously create the Cybertson Fund. Although Cy predated our time, we've heard so many stories about him from his students and those who knew him. Sai clearly inspired in his students a passion for learning and a love of medicine, while also instilling the importance of human connection and community involvement. As Dr. Holmes noted, the annual Cybertson Awards were established in 1985. And since that time, outstanding fourth year students have been recognized and honored for exemplifying the qualities that Sai embedded into the culture of the medical school. Seth and I feel so fortunate to have been a part of the selection committee over the last three years. Each year, we are so inspired and awed by the excellence of the students who are selected for the award. And this year's group is no different. Each one of you has demonstrated academic excellence, community involvement, global awareness, and you've all worked to further medical knowledge and progress. And in doing so, you have truly inspired all of us and all of those around you. And this is the reason that Seth and I love to contribute to the Cybertson program. It recognizes, supports, and encourages the recipients to take all of these values along with them throughout their careers. And in doing so, you are touching everyone around you by your work. As we move away from the Psy era and those who can provide firsthand accounts of their interactions with Psy and stories about Psy, we feel that our job is to carry forth this wonderful tradition of choosing the best of the best and encouraging them to become our next leaders. This means carrying forward the stories about Psy and continuing to honor the students who have demonstrated academic, humanitarian, and community distinction. Just as Sai's students selflessly gave in 1985 to create this wonderful program, Seth and I feel strongly about ongoing support with our contribution. As we celebrate these amazing scholars and fellow today, we hope you'll consider doing the same. 
And I'm just here as the comic relief, but uh, I have a brief story to just uh, to, to share with all you guys that, that helps explain uh, uh, some of why Martha and I feel the way we do. And this story dates, dates back to uh, 1993, actually. And on the front, um, the front lawn of Remsen, I think in late August, we were sitting down having our initial uh, introductory meetings with all the other students. And I, I looked across and saw this beautiful woman who, uh, who happens to be sitting right here. And, and we started within a, probably a week or so, we were a thing. And so all through first and second year of, of uh, medical school, we, we did a lot of studying together. And uh, we can jump forward, we'll skip three years, we'll get to 1996. And then the Syvertson thing sort of showed up in actually each of our mailboxes. Back then we had mailboxes, this was actually pieces of paper that said we were officially uh, Syvertson uh, scholars. And, and nobody, of course, on the committee knew we were, we were a thing. And we went through the whole interview process that the six of you that are here today uh, went through and, uh, and, and chewed on our fingernails, just like you guys probably did. And then it, the most amazing thing happened, and which is that they, that we didn't, we maybe didn't recognize how amazing this was, but the, the committee said, you know, we just couldn't select a single person. We could only, we, we came up with a tie. And then it turns out it was Martha and I, and, and that was just, we felt like that had to mean something. And, uh, and so uh, I think shortly thereafter, the committee found out that we were, um, we were a thing. And I think within weeks of that, we were actually engaged. And then uh, and then fast forward another year later, and we, I think within one week or within 14 days, we graduated medical school, got married, went on a five-day honeymoon to St. Lucia, and then started our internships in Boston. And so to us, that means everything. And we're going to show you what the one thing that after all of that effort and, and time we spent uh, together and, and all of, I guess, Syvertson times thinking about how we must be valued enough. We're going to share with you what the Syvertson committee has at least partially been a part of creating. And so let's see if we can make this work. Can you guys see that? There we are. So there's actually six of us now. There's six of us. So Martha and I, and then our whole crew uh, down on the Cape. And maybe at some point in their careers, someday one of them might step across uh, the, the medical school lawn and, and have as, um, as, as rewarding an experience as we have had. And so that's, uh, that's my end of things. And I think Martha, you've said what you need to say, right? We're going to sign off and pass this along to the next person in this crew. Terrific. Thank you so very much, Drs. Wu and McLennan. We really appreciate your generosity and your service to the medical school. And so now it's my honor to introduce tonight's scholars and fellow. This year's fellow is soon to be Dr. Chad Lewis and our scholars are Nassim Aziz Golshani, Carissa LeClaire, Jacob Perlson, Soham Reggae, and John Rohde. We are going to transition to the breakout rooms portion of today's program. Our tech team will initiate this and you'll receive a pop-up on your screen to join your breakout room. You'll have roughly 20 minutes in the breakout room to hear your student's story. Please feel free to ask questions and learn more about their experiences here at Geisel. After the breakout session, we'll all come back to the main room for some closing remarks. If you run into any technical issues or are a family member who's been placed in the incorrect room, please find the ask for help button, which is located on the bottom menu bar. Um, and a staff member will join you and get you to where you need to be. So we will now transition to the breakout rooms. All right, so I would thank you guys for joining us in our breakout room. I would like to introduce John Rode, who is gonna share with us today and I will be transitioning his slides. Awesome, yeah, so good evening. Um, thank you so much for joining. Uh, and this is a small intimate group, so please you know, feel free to stay unmuted, ask questions. Um, you know, really my goal is to kind of share my story and, and how I got to uh, where I am today and also some of the, the most important kind of guiding principles that got me there. 
Um, and so, you know, before I, I kind of launch into that, the first thing I wanted to talk about, uh, I know a lot of people like to put this at the end of presentations, but this was so important to me, I wanted to put this up front. Um, and I just wanted to express a huge, huge thank you. I'm so thankful and honored to uh, have been selected as a Cybertson scholar. You know, if you'd asked me 10 years ago, I was um, just a lowly ensign in the US Navy. Uh, if you'd asked me if, if I thought I could go to a post back program, get into Dartmouth Medical School of all places, and um, now be starting my general surgery residency, I would have said there's no way I could do that. And to be able to uh, have accomplished that, and then on top of it, have this incredible honor of, of being inducted into the Cybertson community with such driven and accomplished physicians is a, is a huge honor. I still remember in October, um, during my interview with the Cybertson committee, thinking to myself when everybody was going around introducing themselves and talking about their backgrounds, like, did they mean this, John? Or are they sure they selected the right person? So it's it's been a really humbling experience. So uh, thank you so much. And the other thing I wanted to do and uh, is just express my sincere gratitude to Drs. Wu and McLennan um, for their incredibly generous gift. You know, I had no idea how expensive it would be to uh, transition into intern year, surprisingly. Um, but you know, I've been able to use that gift to fund my medical license, uh, my step three exam um, fees, as well as some prep work. And then most important to me is, uh, you know, my goal is to, is to start, um, you know, with my feet running as soon as I get into residency. And so I've been able to purchase some textbooks. Uh, if you're familiar with like the cyber, excuse me, the um, Sabiston's text, Zollinger, and then the Marino's ICU book. So, um, you know, that gift is just incredibly amazing to me. And I'm so, so thankful to, um, to have received that. And it, it's really going to be able to contribute for me to have a strong foundation going into residency. So thank you so much. And so, um, you know, it's it's uh, it's hard to put my entire kind of story into a in a short slideshow, but I wanted to at least start with uh, where I where I began, and that was in uh, Bryn Mawr, Pennsylvania, which is a suburban town just outside of the amazing city of Philadelphia. I was so lucky to grow up there. It's such a diverse area. I used to go to the art museum there when they had their free weekends. Uh, it's in the the skyline picture on the bottom left, and then uh, the Philadelphia Orchestra had some free student concerts at a venue nearby that I used to go to. So, I love Philadelphia; just an amazing city. I used to row on the river, the Schuylkill River there, uh, but really my sport was swimming. Um, and Dr. Auerbach and I have uh, traded some emails back and forth about something that I said that I know resonated with him especially. But um, swimming is, is a very difficult sport and, um, you know, you're in the pool four hours a day, twice a day, usually, at, you know, as a 16 year old, you're getting up at 5 AM going to practice. And, um, you know, it's one of those sports where, you know, you can work as be the hardest working person in the pool, do everything right. And sometimes you fall short and you don't win the race or you don't, you know, go, go as fast as you want to. And that's okay. You know, at a very young age, I learned that it's really about the journey and the hard work you put into it and not necessarily where you end up. And it's been a guiding principle that's, uh, you know, I've, I've held dear throughout my, my time getting to where I am today. So just a picture of me down there in college on the bottom left and then on the right hand uh, side uh, in high school. And then uh, I would be remiss if I didn't mention my family. Um, you know, this is a family photo back from 2007 in the background are my cousins and my uncle uh, in the foreground, my mom there on the left and my grandma who actually passed away uh, two weeks into when I started at Geisel. And then myself and my uncle, my mom's younger brother. Um, and then the essay that I submitted to the Cyberson Committee, I mentioned um, about some of the challenges I had growing up. You know, my, uh, my father really wasn't in the picture and. Um, you know, my whole family dealt with uh, pretty significant physical and mostly mental health issues, and my grandparents were aging, and so I was you know, kind of became the sole caretaker of my mother um, at a very young age, and, and I relied on just the incredible kindness and selflessness of the people around me, whether that was my neighbors, my friends, parents, teachers, mentors from school, just people that were, you know, so supportive, and, you know, someone that uh, is, is very special to me is my uncle. Um, my mom's older um, brother, actually in the background there with the glasses. Uh, he is also a fellow Navy veteran. He served uh, towards the latter years of Vietnam and early into the Cold War uh, hunting submarines. And 
uh, just an incredibly kind and funny person. He used to come to my swim meets with his chest painted uh, with my last name, Runner, under it, like Roadie Runner. And if you've ever been to a swim meet, it's not exactly that type of raucous environment. So uh, he definitely stood out in the crowd. So it was nice to kind of stand on the starting block and see my uncle up there. And um, he passed away in his 50s from colorectal carcinoma. And uh, I still remember to this day, you know, um, during his last days, he was in a VA hospital near where I grew up. And he was contacting other veterans that he met through his care at the VA for his cancer uh, to try to assist me in my goal of uh, serving as a Naval officer. Um, I was applying to Navy officer candidate school at the time, and he was, uh, you know, making phone calls and you know, it, it's, I've just always strived to embody that level of selflessness where, you know, a man who was just in immense pain facing the end of his life was able to continue to give to others instead of focusing inward during his, his time of need. So he's been a very special person to me and uh, has taught me something that I've, I've, uh, I've, I've held dear. And really, I think, as you'll see, uh, as I move on to, uh, to the, to the latter slides, it's really been one of the guiding principles that's gotten me to, uh, to where I am today and, and, and got me to medical school. And so uh, I did join the Navy, uh, but before that I graduated uh, from Connecticut College in 2009. I majored in philosophy and economics. And I like to put these two pictures next to each other because on the right-hand side, you'll see my kind of uh, you know, staunch military uh, personality, but then on the left-hand side, uh, believe it or not, yes, I was uh, the musical director of an a cappella group in college, so I do have a softer side in there somewhere, um, but uh, so I, I graduated from Connecticut College in 2009 um, and moved on to Officer Candidate School in Newport, Rhode Island, and was commissioned as a Naval Surface Warfare Officer in 2010. And so I was on active duty in the Navy from 2010 to 2016 and held positions in hugely disparate fields. Uh, for some reason, the Navy thought it would be a great idea to take a philosophy and economics major and put them in the engineering department. So I was an engineer on the USS Kidd, the destroyer there up in the top middle, um, deployed once, did a lot of counter piracy operations in the Middle East. Um, and then I moved on to uh, the USS Boxer, where I was the amphibious landing craft officer. Uh, so I planned ship to shore movement with hovercraft and landing craft for the Marine Corps, uh, deployed on that ship as well to the Middle East. And then uh, my final tour, I taught Tomahawk cruise missile tactics to the US Navy's Pacific Fleet. And I absolutely love my time in the Navy and would not trade it for anything in the world. Having those opportunities to lead our nation's sailors, whether it was in combat or training, uh, were really second to none. But what I felt the most fulfilled by and the most energized by during my time in the military was taking care of my sailors. Um, if you could move on to the next slide, I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit more. So here are uh, um, a few of my sailors on the left-hand side. That's Petty Officer Baez in the back behind the gas turbine generator. Uh, I still remember helping him navigate the incredibly complex uh, citizenship process for his family who lived in Mexico at the time. Um, and then on the right-hand side is Petty Officer Anchetta. I still remember we were uh, off the coast of San Diego doing a training operation when he got a phone call that his wife was in labor with their first daughter. And um, I coordinated getting him, I think we went from uh, our ship to a small boat, to a helicopter, to a friend who was going to pick him up to get him to the hospital. And if I wasn't going to do it, he was going to swim. So it was those types of, of moments during my time in the military that I really cherished was, um, you know, taking care of my sailors and helping them achieve their goals and, and getting them to where they wanted to be. And during my second tour, when I was on the USS Boxer, it's a larger ship with a medical department. And so I was able to do some shadowing um, and I you know, took vital signs, gave some immunizations and, and realized you know, eventually that there really was no uh, better way to kind of couple that ability to, excuse me, desire to care for other people than through medicine. It's the most fundamental way, I think, to care for other people. And so I decided to uh, let the sun set on my Navy career 
if you go to the next slide, Amanda, and, um, and apply into uh, post back programs. So um, this is just a picture from the, uh, we were out in the Pacific, it's just a, incredible views from a ship. Um, and so I, I actually moved back home to Philadelphia and was able to attend a post back program at Bryn Mawr College, which was just a transformative year for me. Um, I still remember getting the email that I was accepted to Dartmouth Medical School and walking out into the parking lot and seeing a classmate of mine, Sand, and just giving her a huge hug. Uh, and she's actually in the next slide. Um, the top left picture, that's Sand on my, uh, excuse me, on the right side of the picture, and then Allie on the left. We both went from Bryn Mawr to uh, Geisel, and that was our orientation trip uh, in 2017. We went to Holtz Ledge, which is an awesome hike right by the Dartmouth Skiway, if you've ever been. Um, and then Sand and I also in the anatomy lab and our scrubs there. And then myself, obviously, at the, at the white coat ceremony. And so I, I went from Bryn Mawr to Geisel, and um, it was just been an amazing four years. I, I'd be also remiss if I didn't mention Dr. Catlin here. Um, I don't know if you, you, you all are familiar with Dr. Catlin, but uh, you know, during my didactic years, she just stood out as an incredibly dedicated teacher and mentor, especially in the anatomy lab. Um, he was the first person to really get me interested in surgery. Um, I remember in the anatomy lab, he just shared so many of his failures and successes in the operating room. And he's such a humbled, excuse me, uh, such a humble and accomplished human being and somebody I look up to immensely and, and hope to be as good of a surgeon uh, as he was. And, um, you know, again, Dartmouth has provided such amazing opportunities that I'm so thankful for. Um, you know, the, the first two years were definitely grueling being in the classroom the entire time and pouring over textbooks and, and PowerPoint slides. But, you know, I found a way to kind of stay connected to my purpose in medicine of caring for others. I, I volunteered at some local flu clinics and I managed one of the student run free clinics known as the Mascoma Clinic. Um, it provides care to underserved and under resourced uh, community members of the Upper Valley which was great, not only because I got to learn some clinical skills early on, but I also was able to give back to the vulnerable members of the community that I've called home for the past four years. So I really valued that. Uh, I've also gotten involved in research. I did some outcomes research in trauma and vascular surgery. So that's a um, poster presentation that we did at Dartmouth on the top right. Um, and then I also helped uh, co-found Dartmouth's um, Uniform Services Student Group which is comprised of veterans as well as our family members. And really our, our mission is to um, assist in the recruitment of veterans to Geisel, to foster camaraderie amongst each other and strengthen our leadership skills and also to provide networking opportunities. And the one thing I also wanted to mention too uh, is I've been involved in Dartmouth's uh, Diversity, Equity and Inclusion Committee. Specifically, one of my interests is medical education. And so I, I've worked uh, on projects to improve the delivery of our health disparities curriculum. And I have to say it has gone so many miles since when I started in 2017. And I'm so thankful for the school embracing that and for so many of my classmates uh, for getting on board. And, and uh, it's, it's just gone leaps and bounds from 2017. So I'm, I'm very proud of that. And then uh, I would also be remiss if I didn't mention my better half here. So uh, when I, Went into my clinical years, uh, my third year, I started off in San Francisco at um, California Pacific Medical Center. And I reconnected with my, my girlfriend that we actually dated in college. And, and um, we've been together now for two years. Uh, so thank you to Geisel for, for letting me go back to San Francisco for a, for a rotation and to reconnect with her. And then, uh, you know, as I transitioned into my clinical years and started to see patients, it, it really became starkly obvious to me that I had found my calling. And I don't think there's a better exemplification than that, uh, of that than this picture. This is a, p a piece by one of my patients when I was on my trauma and acute care surgery acting internship. Uh, she was a woman that I cared for for over a month. Um, she had suffered from multiple complications from a necrotic small bowel obstruction. Uh, ended up with an ostomy that she had to learn to live with. And um, her spirit was just indomitable. She had so many setbacks and just was such a positive human being. I still remember rounding on her one time in the afternoon. And, um, you know, our patient census at that point was abnormally low for the acute care surgery service. And we spent about an hour talking about 
uh, her career as an illustrator with Jim Henson uh, and some of her current art projects, one of which is this piece that's in the, the halls of Dartmouth Hitchcock. Um, it's a piece of raw um, birch plywood with some burnt pieces of um, birch plywood on top that is just an incredible depiction of this river with this couple tubing down the river and on the left, this, uh, this man net fishing. And so, you know, it's, it's really been that immense privilege that we have as healthcare providers to, to change people's lives that I value so much about the path that I've chosen. You know, that we have patients that are mothers, fathers, daughters, brothers, sisters, you know, artists, singers, just incredibly unique, amazing human beings. Um, and the ability to serve these people and support them and being the person they want to be and achieving the goals they want to achieve makes the field of medicine so immensely rewarding. And I'm so glad that uh, Dartmouth has given me that opportunity to, to really find my calling in that way. And so I am excited to share that I will be able to continue to uh, connect with my patients to enable them to lead uh, happier and healthier lives by um, uh, starting my uh, categorical general surgery internship and residency at uh, Northwestern in Chicago. And uh, that's kind of the next chapter that Amy and I are on to. And so again, I, thank you so much for this opportunity to share my story. And, and I'm so honored and humbled to be selected as a Cybertson Scholar. So thank you so much. Wow. <clears throat> can, I, can I say something? Please. <clears throat> John, that, that's a wonderful, wonderful story. I'm Saul Rockemacher, a DMS class of 61, lived down in Bedford, New Hampshire. Uh, but, you know, your story is you're, you are a man on a mission, on a continuing mission. You've taken care of your family. You've taken care of your sailor colleagues. You're taking care of your patients. And I think that you've got a wonderful mission ahead. And uh, I, I refer you to, if you haven't read this already, to a, a paper written by Dr. Francis Peabody in the 1920s called The Care of the Patient. Mm -hmm. uh, Francis Peabody was one of the Boston Peabodys. It was chief of, of medicine in the Harvard service at Boston City Hospital. The last sentence of his paper is, the care of the patient is caring the patient. And I think you've got that. You've got that in you. Uh, I, I was fortunate enough to have known Dean Syvertson. I was class of 61. Uh, I was there when he taught some classes. And I remember him in the lab looking over our shoulders and so forth. I also remember that's the time he passed away. And uh, I think you, you know, you're going to continue his tradition, and uh, uh, I, I'm so proud of you. And, and also, will tell you that I'm I'm a Navy man. Uh, I was uh, a pediatrician at the Station Hospital at U.S. Naval Training Center in Bainbridge, Maryland, which is in, no longer in existence, but had various schools, including one of the nuclear power schools, and had the pleasure of taking care of dependents. But welcome. Thank you so much. I know we have to race back, but John, uh, I was lucky enough to sort of uh, meet you <laughs> and, and hear your story before, but it's so wonderful. And I also feel like, so I'll take virtual pride in um, all that you've done, but just the way that you presented, it was so lovely to to get to know this a little bit more. And like, so, uh, with Sol, I would say that this idea of um, you're somebody who's really on a mission and, and, you know, some people, the mission is just sort of there, words on the wall and they're busy getting their own thing done. But I really feel you know, it exudes from you this embodiment that um, it's the spirit, you know, of the, 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 um, the naval forces and the protection and the ability to serve others that is a core part of you. And it's truly inspiring. I feel like overjoyed to, to have even this connection with you. And I'm so excited to see your development. Thank you so much. That means a lot. Well, welcome back, everyone. I hope that each of you enjoyed your time connecting with one of our students this evening. And I'd like to give our fellow Chad Lewis a moment to share a couple of comments. Thank you, Dr. Holmes, I appreciate it. Um, I'll, I'll be pretty quick. I just wanted to uh, take a minute to thank everyone for coming tonight. Um, it's unfortunate that we weren't all able to be together in person this year. 
Um, but I hope that everyone had some great conversations in their respective rooms. Um, I know that that we did in my room. It was really a great experience. Um, I love connecting with faculty and alumni. Um, we just talked about uh, the impact that Geisel's had on us uh, throughout our medical education um, and I'm sure beyond for the faculty that are here. Uh, I, I said something along the lines of there, there's something special in the water here uh, that really um, encourages people to pursue their passions and to really try to make a positive impact on the community. And I think that uh, that's one of the things that's really powerful about this award. Um, you know, not only does it recognize the academic merit that uh, that the, the the fellow and scholars have, have brought uh, during their time here, but also the citizenship that they've exhibited. And um, you know, I, when I look at my peers here that I am also receiving this award alongside of, I'm I feel really honored because. Uh, I, they're all superstars. I think very easily any one of us could have been the fellow. Uh, we're relatively interchangeable in the sense that we've all made such a big impact on uh, the community here. And uh, I just feel really humbled uh, to be a, a, a part of this. And uh, I just want to thank the alumni and the Syvertson Committee um, and the donors to the Syvertson Fund uh, for helping not only lessen uh, the, the, the debt of, of education that, that we've experienced, but also, um, you know, on a more personal note, uh, my mother passed away from COVID six weeks ago, and uh, we were really in a tight spot uh, with having to um, pay for the moving expenses to Iowa and to cover her um, funeral expenses and uh, the timing that this award had uh, really helped us when, when we really needed it. So I just want to say thank you. And it, it really means a lot to me personally. And I know it means a lot to the rest of the awardees tonight too. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chad, and, and all of our scholars and, and donors, and, and each of you for joining us this evening. We've all heard how important that scholarship support here is at the, at the medical school. So we're, we're in the middle of a call to lead campaign. We are seeking $20 million in new endowed scholarship support. Julie Bresser, who is our Regional Director of Development, is on our call this evening and would be happy to connect with any of you who would like to have a conversation about making an impact through philanthropy. So I wanted to thank you all for joining us this evening and congratulations again to all of our scholars. I hope to welcome you back to campus when we can all do that. Please remember today's program was recorded and will be made available to you for a follow-up survey that will be sent to you tomorrow. Uh, please take a brief moment to provide your feedback to help us enhance future programming. And again, thank you for joining us this evening and spending time together with us and with our students and have a really wonderful evening.